More on the heat wave and climate change, I'm joined now by Shweta Chakravarti. She is a risk and behavioral scientist, speaks regularly on the changing planet, and it is changing, isn't it? What do you make of all of this? You know what? A lot of people want to dismiss this year. And it's not. The reality is, is this is what it's going to be like going forward. This period, five-year period, give or take a few years, is going to be the hottest five-year period in recorded history thus far. This isn't a fluke, and climate scientists have known this for some time. What this means for the world is we need to really seriously think about proactively adapting. Parts of the world are already experiencing this. We see what's going on in Europe right now with the heat waves, but other parts of the world that haven't had the impacts yet doesn't mean that they're not going to be feeling them. So there really is an urgency in a period of time coming up now that we need to act. You're sounding the alarm, and you're not alone. Uh, I've heard similar comments from other people that I've interviewed. How frustrating is it uh, to go on? Uh, you're not just on this broadcast. You've been on others today. Yep. You know, this clarion call, it, it seems like um, it's falling on deaf ears with some. I mean, policy people. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And it's, why is this happening, really? And as a behavioral scientist, I study this phenomenon, and it's twofold. One is that the risk landscape around us has evolved faster than our brains have. So traditionally, since our species, the dawn of our species, we have, we have been in risk situations where it's been very much survival instinct. You see a snake, you run away. And since then, we have had science and tech uh, advances and innovations to the point where we have been able to protect ourselves from the most unnatural risks. But now we have these existential risks that have come from all of this human ingenuity and advancement. So our brains haven't caught up to that. And ultimately, what's happening is this inability to recognize that these risks are unfamiliar, they seem far away, and we don't really know how to respond beyond that sea snake run. In addition to that, what we have are communities of people who really identify with one another. And for them, it is part of their identity to say that, OK, I may be a conservative, and there is a 70% correlation with being a conservative and also denying climate change. So there is a really strong tribal force here that is at hand that we need to overcome. We need to overcome our basic innate desire to just stay um, comfortably in our risk environment. And we need to also recognize that we can separate various risks from who we are and what our identities are. It's almost fight or flight kind of a concept. I guess it's like the deer in the headlights, they freeze. It seems so huge. Do you think that's part of the problem is that people can't get their arms around it? That's what it is. I mean, it's huge. It's far away. A lot of people that are not experiencing these impacts, it still sounds to them like stories that other people are de dealing with in other parts of the world. So it's not in my backyard. So it's not something I need to be concerned about. But what we're doing a better job at, albeit too slowly, if you ask me and those who work in the space of communicating the science and the risk around climate change specifically, is we need to make this more relevant. We need to make it more immediate and more urgent for those who might not, I mean, luckily, lucky for them, but at some point we are all part of this ecosystem and we are going to experience the impacts, even if not right now, even if we don't have sea level rise impacting and flooding impacting our home along the coast, or we don't have to experience wildfires that a lot of the West Coast has been experiencing in the US. Mm -hmm. So how do you still make those stories and those risks an urgency for those who haven't had those experiences yet? That's what we have to work on. I've got to ask you about this concept of urban heat island, which is a, a serious problem in Paris and these other big cities, where the heat is just kind of trapped, isn't it? Right, and these are places that don't have the infrastructure to deal with these heat, heat temperatures. They've historically never had to deal with it. But again, this is not something that is an isolated event. This is something that we now know is going to increase in nature. In fact, research and studies are showing that this is going to be compounded to the point where we're going to have heat waves back to back mm. as the years get, get closer closer to that three degree warming, which is what we're on the path for by the end of the century. Remember from the Paris Accords, we were trying to keep the maximum temperature, global temperature under two. We are now on the way to under three and we're already experiencing this at a one degree increase in Celsius. So these urban centers really need to recognize that even if we are able to offset some of those worst case scenarios, we still need to adapt because we're locked into some degree of warming. Well, Shweta, I'm sure we'll have you back on the broadcast as this problem is not going away. Thanks so much for coming in, though. Thank really you for having me.